Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 66 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the disappearance of Amelia Earhart. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. On July 2nd, 1937, famed aviator Amelia Earhart was nearing the end of her record-breaking round-the-world flight. She was over the Pacific Ocean, nearing a refueling stop on Howland Island. She sent radio messages to the Coast Guard vessel Itasca, which was trying to guide her on her approach to Howland Island. But something was wrong, desperately wrong, and Amelia Earhart vanished without a trace, leaving a mystery that remains to this day. And that's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. So let's start with the basics. Who was Amelia Earhart? She was born in 1897 in Atchison, Kansas. Her father was an attorney, and she had a bit of an unconventional upbringing because her mother didn't believe in forcing her children to be, quote, nice little girls, close (laughs) quote. As a result of that and her natural inclinations, she was something of a tomboy, and she was quite adventurous. She was raised Episcopalian and enjoyed singing in the church choir. She also was a member of the Altar Guild, which helped keep the church in good order by caring for the linens, making floral arrangements, and holding fundraisers. In 1920, when she was 24, she and her family were living in Long Beach, California, just up the road from me, and her father took her to an airfield where the famous pilot Frank Hawks gave her a 10-minute airplane ride that cost her father $10. It changed her life. Earhart said, by the time I'd gotten two or three hundred feet off the ground, I knew I had to fly. Working a variety of jobs, including photographer, truck driver, and (laughs) stenographer, she saved up a thousand dollars for flying lessons. To reach the airport where she took lessons, she had to take a bus to the end of the line and then walk four miles, showing her dedication to the task. She also undertook an image makeover. To fit in with the other pilots, she got a leather jacket and slept in it for three nights to give it a worn look, (laughs) and she cut her hair short to imitate the style of other female aviators. And this was 1920. This was the early days of aviation, right? I mean, the the Wright brothers had only flown for the first time a few years previously. So... Did she show balloon? I like I like that uh, Middle English voc- inner vocalic shift there. Yes, yeah. that was entirely intentional on my part. I think. <laughs> <laughs> so did did she show promise as a pilot? Yeah, in 1922, less than two years after starting lessons, and even before she earned her pilot's license, she flew at an altitude of 14,000 feet, setting a world record for female pilots. And in 1923, the next year, she became the 16th woman in the United States to be issued a pilot's license by the Fédération Aeronautique Internationale. Unfortunately, though, her family's finances took a turn for the worse and she had to sell her plane. But she bought a sporty yellow roadster and drove her mom across the country, and eventually they settled in your hometown, Dom, Boston, Massachusetts, where she took work as a teacher and later a social worker. She also became a member of the Boston chapter of the American Aeronautical Association and was elected its vice president. In 1927, she flew the first official flight out of Denison Airport in Quincy, Massachusetts, which is one of Boston's suburbs. Just a few miles from me, in fact. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. The big news in 1927 wasn't her flight, though. It was Charles Lindbergh's first solo flight across the Atlantic Ocean from Long Island, New York to Paris, France, and this led to Earhart's next record-setting event. In 1928, she was invited to become the first woman to fly across the Atlantic, and in July, she flew from Newfoundland, Canada to South Wales in Great Britain. But she was a little subdued about the event. Most of the flight was made on instruments, 
and Earhart didn't have training in that kind of aviation. As a result, all of the flying was done by another pilot named Wilmer Stultz. Afterwards, Earhart told a reporter, Stultz did all the flying, had to. I was just baggage, like a sack of potatoes. But, she added, maybe someday I'll try it alone. But how did people react about this once she got back to the States? It totally did not matter. She was still the first woman to fly across the Atlantic, even if she was just a passenger. When she and the crew got back to the U.S., they received a ticker tape parade in Manhattan and a reception at the White House with President Calvin Coolidge. Charles Lindbergh had been named Lucky Lindy by the press, and so they started referring to Amelia as Lady Lindy and as Queen of the Air. She became a celebrity, and to make money, she started doing celebrity product endorsements. These included endorsements for things like women's clothing, sportswear, luggage, and Lucky Strike cigarettes. She used the $1,500 she got from Lucky Strike as a donation to Commander Richard Byrd's 1928 South Pole edition of that same year. Uh, she also became an, edit, an associate editor for Cosmopolitan magazine, and at the time, Cosmo was owned by the media tycoon William Randolph Hearst, the guy that Citizen Kane is based on, mm -hmm. and it was a literary magazine at the time. It wasn't until the 1960s that Cosmopolitan became a wellspring of pure evil. <laughs> so it was a respectable literary magazine at the time. Uh, things change. Uh, so what was going on with her aviation career at the time? In 1928, she set another record, becoming the first woman to fly solo across North America and back. In 1929, she began promoting commercial air travel, which was a really new thing at the time. I mean, previously, you might go to an airfield or a country fair and pay to take a little joyride on a plane, but ordinary people were not in the habit of using airplanes to travel from one place to another. And along with Charles Lindbergh, Amelia started representing transcontinental tran air transport, which later became Trans World Airways, or TWA, today. She also became vice president of National Airways, which later became Northeast Airlines. On her own, she also started flying competitively as an air racer. In 1929, she took part in the first women's air derby, flying from Santa Monica, California, to Cleveland, Ohio, and she came in third. She became a founding member of a women's aviation organization known as the 99s, based on their number of founding members. And in 1930, she was elected the first president of the 99s. Also that year, she became an official of the National Aeronautic Association. And in this position, she actively promoted the idea of establishing separate records for women's pilots, for women pilots, and men pilots. So you'd have like, different distance records or different uh, speed records for female pilots versus male pilots. I'm not sure why you'd need this. It, it's because the plane does most of the work. So I wondered, well, is there a physical difference? I mean, it makes sense like in basketball or something to have different men's and women's records because the physical differences there on average, you know, make have a notable effect on what happens in the game. But I'm not sure why you would need that in an airplane. One thought that occurred to me was maybe she just wanted to clear the field of all those records set by males so she could set a bunch of new ones herself. <laughs> or or maybe there was some physical difference between men and women pilots that made a difference, at least in the airplanes they had back in the 1930s. So... Wondering about that, I reached out to a gentleman who will be well-known to longtime SQPN listeners, Captain Jeff of the Airline Pilot Guy, who is a commercial pilot for Acme Airlines. And I reached out to him and asked him about why Amelia might want separate men's and women's records. And he wrote back and said, I hadn't heard of that. The only thing I can say regarding physical requirements for flying is that the aircraft in the 1930s did require more upper body physical effort to manipulate the controls. Modern aircraft controls are designed to be much easier to manipulate. Think of power steering. It's my opinion, though, that it wouldn't have been a big deal for Amelia, as she seemed to be in pretty good physical condition. In spite of that, I do not see any reasonable argument to support sex-specific records. Your suspicion of Earhart's desire to have a clean slate may be the real answer. 
Some might argue that having female record-holding slash breaking pilots would inspire more females to enter into the aviation world. And that's something we know Amelia was concerned with. She promoted female aviation, and so it could have been an attempt to, you know, set more women's records, get them in the news more, and and uh, promote more females to come in to the activity. Uh, she also, in 1931, set a world record for altitude flying at 18,415 feet. Wow. Uh, was that a women's record or was that an overall record, you know? That was an overall record, I believe. Okay. It's almost like if there was a uh, separate records for women race car drivers, you know, yeah, exactly. it doesn't make yeah. any sense. The car does a lot of the work. OK, yeah. so so that's her aviation career. What was going on in her personal life during this time? Back in 1928, she'd gotten engaged to a chemical engineer from Boston named Samuel Chapman, but she broke off the engagement. However, she began being courted by the famous publisher, author and explorer George P. Putnam. If you've ever read a book published by G.P. Putnam's sons, he's one of the sons. His father, George Palmer Putnam, founded the company, and he and his brother took it over after their father. The younger George Putnam had been married to a woman named Dorothy Binney, and she was an heiress whose father's company had invented Crayola crayons. Hmm. Together, they had two sons named David and George, but in 1929, they divorced. George Putnam then started courting Amelia, and he really took a shine to her. Reportedly, he asked her to marry him six times before she agreed. Wow. This signaled that Amelia was at least somewhat cool to the idea of marrying him, but they finally got hitched in February of 1931, and further coolness on her part was indicated by a letter that she had hand-delivered to Putnam on the day of their wedding. In part, it read, I want you to understand I shall not hold you to any medieval code of faithfulness to me, nor shall I consider myself bound to you similarly. I may have to keep some place where I can go to be by myself now and then, for I cannot guarantee to endure all, at all times the confinement of even an attractive cage. Ouch. <laughs> Burn. It's just, it's just, what every, just what every groom wants to read on his wedding day. <laughs> her progressive ideas about marriage also were indicated by the fact she kept her own name. Reportedly, she laughed when the New York Times, in keeping with its style sheet at the time, referred to her as Mrs. Putnam. However, she was so famous that some started to refer to Putnam as Mr. Earhart, <laughs> <laughs> kind of like Rory being Mr. Amelia Pond. Yes, uh, Doctor Who. <laughs> yeah. Despite the unconventional relationship they had, from what I can tell, they got along well, and Amelia was fond of Putnam's sons, especially David, who was able to visit them a lot. Did Amelia ever get to fulfill her dream of flying solo across the Atlantic? Yeah, in 1932, she flew by herself from Newfoundland and crossed the Atlantic. She originally uh, planned to land in Paris, like Lindbergh had five years before. But uh, after encountering bad weather and having mechanical problems, she landed in a field in Northern Ireland. And when a surprised farm worker asked if she had flown very far, she gave the jaw-dropping answer, from America. <laughs> At the time, it's As like, you do. <laughs> that has almost never been done. <laughs> yes, it's like saying from the moon. <laughs> yeah. As a result of this record-setting flight, she received the Distinguished Flying Cross from Congress, the Cross of Knight of the Legion of Honor from the French government, and President Herbert Hoover presented her with the Gold Medal of the National Geographic Society. So her husband's publishing house, G.P. Putnam Sons, is based out of New York. So did they stay there? No, he sold his interest in the company to his cousin, and they moved to California. There, Putnam became the head of the editorial board of Paramount Pictures in North Hollywood. Mm. Also, Amelia started working with a Hollywood stunt pilot named Paul Mance to improve her long-distance flying skills. She also went into business with Mance, and the two started a flying school in Burbank. Did she have any more record-setting achievements? In 1935, she became the first person, man or woman, to fly solo from Honolulu, Hawaii to Oakland, California. This trip went so well that she even relaxed and listened to a broadcast of the New York Metropolitan Opera. The same year, she flew solo from Los Angeles to Mexico City, and she flew from Mexico City to New York, though the crowds that greeted her in Newark, New Jersey were so big that she had to be careful not to taxi her plane into them. 
All told, between 1930 and 1935, she set seven women's records for speed and distance. So how did this, uh, uh, the, 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 her big around-the-world flight come about? She started planning it in 1936, and this wouldn't be the first round-the-world flight. Others had done that before, but she was going to do it different. She was going to do it longer. Her plan was to fly as close to the equator as possible. You know, because if you're a mile from the North Pole, you can fly <laughs> around. It's like a six-mile trip, right. you know, pi r squared. But if you fly around the equator, it's like 29,000 miles. And so she was going to do the longest around the world flight ever, male or female. And to that end, in July of 36, she had a Lockheed Electra 10E plane built to her specifications, which, among other things, included extra fuel tanks. <laughs> yes, that makes sense. Was she planning on making the flight solo? No, uh, she was going to be the pilot. She wasn't going to be a sack of potatoes this time. Uh, so she was going to be the pilot, but she was going to take a navigator and a radio operator with her. Uh, at first, it was planned that she would take a man named Harry Manning, but both her husband and her business partner were not happy with Manning's early performance as a navigator in some test flights. Uh, as a result, they got an additional supplemental navigator for part of the route, and the man they found was a guy named Fred Noonan. Uh, he was a good choice because he had been working for Pan American Airways and had established the company's China Clipper routes over the Pacific, and he'd been training Pan Am navigators on the haul between San Francisco and Manila in the Philippines. So he had a lot of experience flying over the Pacific. The plan was to have Noonan serve as the navigator on one leg of the journey from Honolulu to Howland Island, and there's that name, remember, Howland Island is where she was heading when she disappeared. Then Manning would take over and navigate from Howland Island to Australia, and from Australia she would proceed flying westward on her own around the rest of the globe. So what happened with this, uh, this round-the-world flight that she was making? On March 17, 1937, Earhart took off from Oakland, California, and flew west to Honolulu, Hawaii. On board were Earhart, Fred Noonan, Harry Manning, and her business partner, Paul Mance. They got to Hawaii okay, but there were mechanical troubles with the plane, which needed to be serviced at the Naval Air Station in Pearl Harbor. This was a little more than four years before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. And a few days later, the servicing had been done, and they got ready to take off for Howland Island, but they never made it. So this is when she disappeared? No. Oh. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> something else happened. According to Wikipedia, The flight never left Luke Field in Pearl Harbor. During the takeoff run, there was an uncontrolled ground loop. The forward landing gear collapsed, both propellers hit the ground, the plane skidded on its belly, and a portion of the runway was damaged. The cause of the ground loop is con controversial. Some witnesses at Luke Field, including the Associated Press journalists, said they saw a tire blow. Earhart thought either the, the Electra's right tire had blown and or the right landing gear had collapsed. Some sources, including Mance, cited pilot error. And so even her business partner, Paul Mance, thought that Amelia did something which caused the accident. And it was so bad, the plane had to be shipped back to the continental U.S. to be repaired. This caused them to abort the planned round-the-world flight in its earliest stages. It was a crushing blow. What did she do next, then? A few months later, after the plane was fixed, she attempted a cross-country flight from Oakland, California, to Miami, Florida. And she did this without any publicity. This wasn't new or record-breaking. She'd already flown across North America and back. So just going from Oakland to Miami is not that big of a deal. But this time, Amelia was carrying more than herself to Florida. She was also carrying a secret. When she got to Miami, she publicly announced that her second attempt to circumnavigate the globe was underway. The flight from Oakland to Miami was the first leg of the journey, and this time she would be flying eastward around the globe instead of westward. Also, on this trip, Fred Noonan would be with her the whole way. On June 1st, the pair departed Miami and flew to South America, you know, to get closer to the equator. Then they went to Africa, then India, 
then Southeast Asia. And on June 29th, almost a month later, they arrived on the island of New Guinea, just north of Australia. At this point, they had traveled 22,000 miles. They were more than three quarters of the way around the world. Just 7,000 more miles, and Amelia would be the first person, man or woman, to pilot the longest circumnavigation of the globe in history. I mean, you can only imagine how excited she mm-hmm. must have been. But those 7,000 miles were across the Pacific, the world's largest ocean and the place with the fewest spots to land anywhere on the planet. On July 2nd, 1937, Amelia and Fred took off from New Guinea to make the trip. On board, they had 1,100 gallons of fuel. They would fly to Honolulu and then back to Oakland, California, where they started. But first, they needed to stop and refuel at Howland Island. What happened during this flight? Around 3 p.m. local time, Amelia reported that they were flying at 10,000 feet, but would reduce altitude due to clouds they were encountering. And then a couple hours later at 5 p.m., she reported that they were at 7,000 feet and flying at 150 knots, which is a little more than 170 miles an hour. That night, they crossed the international date line. So they were again flying in July 2nd, according to the calendar. Meanwhile, the United States Coast Guard cutter Itasca was moored at Howland Island to help guide them in by radio navigation. They heard by radio from Amelia at 2.45 a.m. and again just before 5 a.m. And then it became clear that something was wrong. According to Wikipedia, At 6.14 a.m., another call was received stating the aircraft was within 200 miles and requested that the ship use its direction finder to provide a bearing for the aircraft. Earhart began whistling into the microphone to provide a continual signal for them to home in on. It was at this point that the radio operators on the Itasca realized that their radio direction finding system could not tune in the aircraft's 3,105 kilohertz frequency. Radio man Leo Bellarts later commented that he was sitting there sweating blood because I couldn't do a darn thing about it. A similar call asking for a bearing was received at 6.45 a.m. when Earhart estimated they were 100 miles out. Later, it was determined that the radio problems may have been caused because of Amelia's unfamiliarity with the plane's new radio equipment. Also, she may have even deliberately removed some of the equipment because it was inconvenient. Whatever the case, she could transmit to the Itasca, but she couldn't receive everything it was trying to transmit to her. Another message was received by the Itasca between 7.30 and 7.40 a.m., and according to the Itasca radio log, Earhart on Northwest says running out of gas, only half hour left, can't hear us at all. We hear her and are sending on 3,105 ES-500, same time, constantly. At 7.42, the Itasca logged another communication stating, KHAQQ, that is Amelia's plane, Calling Atasca, we must be on you but cannot see you, but gas is running low, been unable to reach you by radio. We are flying at 1,000 feet. Things were getting frantic on the Atasca, according to Wikipedia. Earhart's 7.58 a.m. transmission said she couldn't hear the Atasca and asked them to send voice signals so she could try to take a radio bearing. This transmission was reported by the Atasca as the loudest possible signal, indicating Earhart and Noonan were in the immediate area. They couldn't send voice at the frequency she asked for, so Morse code signals were sent instead. Earhart acknowledged receiving these, but said she was unable to determine their direction. In her last known transmission at 8.43 a.m., Earhart broadcast, We are on the line 157337. We will repeat this message. We will repeat this on 6,210 kilocycles. Wait. However, a few moments later, she was back on the same frequency, 3,105 kilohertz, with a transmission that was logged as questionable. Quote, we are running online north and south, end quote. Earhart's transmissions seemed to indicate that she and Noonan believed they had reached Howland's charted position, which was incorrect by about five nautical miles. The Itasca used her oil-fired boilers to generate smoke for a period of time, but the flyers apparently did not see it. 
The many scattered clouds in the area around Howland Island have also been cited as a problem. Their dark shadows on the ocean surface may have been almost indistinguishable from the island's subdued and very flat profile. And that was it. Amelia and Fred had vanished. So what happened next? The people on the Itasca continued frantically trying to reach Amelia by radio, but it's unclear whether she was able to respond. They picked up some transmissions, but they were weak and hopelessly garbled. According to Wikipedia, Operators across the Pacific and the United States may have heard signals from the downed Electra, but these were unintelligible or weak. Some of these reports of transmissions were later determined to be hoaxes, but others were deemed authentic. Bearings taken by Pan American Airway stations suggested signals originating from several locations, including Gardner Island, 360 miles to the south-southeast. It was noted at the time that if these signals were from Earhart and Noonan, they must have been on land with the aircraft since water would have otherwise shorted out the electric's electrical system. Sporadic signals were reported for four or five days after the disappearance, but none yielded any understandable information. The captain of the USS Colorado later said, quote, There was no doubt many stations were calling the Earhart plane on the plane's frequency, some by voice and others by signal. All of these added to the confusion and doubtfulness of the authenticity of the reports. Yeah, and notice that some of them they said were hoaxes, which is just really I mean, that's unconscionable, wick, wicked, <laughs> yeah. you know, to, to you're trying to find a lost person and someone's hoaxing messages from them. That's just terrible. In, in any event, about an hour after the last radio contact, the Itasca began a physical search for the plane, checking the waters north and west of Howland Island. Then the U.S. Navy joined the search. On July 6th, four days after the event, the captain of the battleship Colorado was ordered to take over and coordinate all search efforts. According to Wikipedia, Later search efforts were directed to the Phoenix Islands south of Howland Island. A week after the disappearance, naval aircraft from the Colorado flew over several islands in the group, including Gardner Island, now called Nikumaroro, which had been uninhabited for over 40 years. The subsequent report on Gardner read, Here, signs of recent habitation were clearly visible, but repeated circling and zooming failed to elicit any answering wave from possible inhabitants, and it was finally taken for granted that none were there. At the western end of the island, a tramp steamer of about 4,000 tons lay high and almost dry head on to the coral beach with her back broken in two places. The lagoon at Gardner looked sufficiently deep and certainly large enough so that a seaplane or even an airboat could have landed or taken off in any direction with li little if any difficulty. Given a chance, it is believed that Miss Earhart could have landed her aircraft in this lagoon and swum or waded ashore. End quote. They also found that Gardner's shape and size, as recorded on charts, were wholly inaccurate. Other Navy search efforts were again directed north, west, and southwest of Howland Island, based on a possibility the Electra had ditched in the ocean, was afloat, or that the aviators were in an emergency raft. The official search efforts lasted until July 19, 1937. At $4 million, the air and, search, air and sea search by the Navy and Coast Guard was the most costly and intensive in U.S. history up to that time. And even afterwards, the search continued. The aircraft carrier USS Lexington, the battleship USS Colorado, the Itasca, the Japanese oceanographic survey vessel Koshu, and the Japanese seaplane tender Kamoi searched for six or seven days each, covering 150,000 square miles. Immediately after the end of the official search, Amelia's husband George Putnam financed a private search by local authorities of nearby Pacific Islands and waters, concentrating on the Gilberts. In late July 1937, Putnam chartered two small boats, and while he remained in the United States, directed a search of the Phoenix Islands, Christmas Island, Fanning Island, the Gilbert Islands, and the Marshall Islands, but no trace of the Electra or its occupants was found. Back in the United States, Putnam acted to become the trustee of Earhart's estate, so that he could pay for the searches and related bills. In probate court in Los Angeles, Putnam requested to have the declared death and absentia seven-year waiting period waived so that he could manage Earhart's finances. As a result, Earhart was declared legally dead on January 5, 1939. 
And that was it. Amelia and her navigator had disappeared, but people only continued to speculate about what had happened to her. So what are the theories out there about Amelia Earhart's disappearance? Well, despite what you saw in Star Trek Voyager, (laughs) there is no evidence that Amelia Earhart was abducted by aliens. But we need to get this one out of the way because... It's It's always always aliens. aliens. Yeah. (laughs) Now, let's look at the theories that have actually been proposed and investigated. The first is the crash and sink theory, that the plane crashed and then sank, and that was it. Also, there is the Gardner Island theory, that she and Fred made it to Gardner Island and survived there for at least a period of time. Then there's the idea that they may have crashed on New Britain, another island in the area. Then there's a theory that they were captured by the Japanese, and there are several variants on this. On In one variant, they landed on Saipan, and on another variant, they landed not on Saipan, but somewhere in the Marshall Islands, though they may have later been taken to Saipan. There are several additional variants regarding this other than where they landed. One is that they were spies, and that's why the Japanese captured them, because they were spying for FDR. Also, there's a variant that holds that Amelia was one of the women forced to make Tokyo Rose broadcasts during World War II. And there are also variants saying that they were executed by the Japanese. Finally, there is a really wild theory that Amelia survived and took on a new identity in the United States, and we know who she was. Wow. Okay. So what can we say about Amelia Earhart's disappearance from the faith perspective? This is a natural mystery rather than a supernatural one, so there's not a lot to say about it from the faith perspective. By way of an aside, Earhart's explicit rejection of the idea of fidelity on the eve of her marriage would suggest that if she were alive and a Catholic, there'd be a really good case for an annulment. But uh, however that may be, we can still pray for her soul and that of her navigator, Fred Noonan. Excellent. Because it's never too late to pray for someone. That's right, because God is outside of time. Yeah. Uh, What can we say about Amelia Earhart's disappearance from the reason perspective then? Let's start by looking at perhaps the wildest theory, the one that she survived and changed her identity. According to this, she became a woman named Irene Bolum, who was a banker in the 1940s, lived in New Jersey, and died in 1982. This claim was made in a 1970 book by an author named Joe Class, and it was called Amelia Earhart Lives. It was published by McGraw-Hill, who was a you know respectable publisher. Mm-hmm. However... Bolum didn't like the claim that she was Amelia Earhart living under another name, (laughs) and so she filed a $1.5 million lawsuit against McGraw-Hill. She submitted a detailed affidavit arguing she couldn't be Amelia, and McGraw-Hill withdrew the book from publication and paid her a cash settlement. Subsequently, researchers have documented Bolum's life story showing that, yeah, she couldn't be Amelia. Also, in 2006, National Geographic had a forensic expert examine photographs of Earhart and Boland, and he concluded that there were many measurable differences in their facial structures. Yeah, Uh, I can imagine what it would be like to be be, uh, pointed out as suddenly out of nowhere, oh, you're uh, this famous person. Uh, All all, uh, theories contradicting, I am not the Lindbergh baby. For various reasons. (laughs) So I just want to get that out there right now. So uh, what about the idea that Amelia was Tokyo Rose? So for people who may not be aware, Tokyo Rose was a nickname that was given by U.S. troops to any number of women who did English language propaganda broadcasts for the Japanese during World War II. What would happen, and they had equivalents of this over in Europe, but they would put on these variety shows on the radio. So you could like listen to American jazz and stuff like that. And then every so often, Tokyo Rose would come on and say, oh, I really care about you guys and don't want any of you hurt. So go ahead and surrender. That would be great. (laughs) Right. Apparently, George Putnam personally investigated the Tokyo Rose idea, and he listened to multiple recordings of different Tokyo Roses but he didn't recognize Emilia's voice as any of them. And so the this variant of the Japanese capture theory doesn't look likely. So what about the idea that she and Fred Noonan were spies for the American government? Well, if that's if that were true, it would explain why the Japanese would capture Emilia rather than rescue her. 
You know, otherwise it's hard to explain them doing that. I mean, they would have looked like heroes if they rescued the world famous aviator. But if they found materials on her or the plane that indicated she was spying, that would change matters. This idea was actually used as the plot of a 1943 movie called Flight for Freedom, starring Rosalind Russell and Fred McMurray. In it, Rosalind Russell plays a female aviator who's clearly based on Amelia Earhart. She's spying for President Franklin Roosevelt by checking out Japanese installations in the Pacific. And this movie helped popularize or further popularize the idea that Amelia had been captured as a spy. But extensive searches of records have not turned up any evidence of this. And so it doesn't look likely. Because the U.S. government would have had old records of spies and presidential orders and all that sort of stuff. Okay, All that sort of stuff. Also, we got the Japanese records after World War II. Okay, And so that leads to what, what about the idea that she was captured by the Japanese and then executed? This would be improbable unless they thought she was a spy. Otherwise, it would have been to their advantage to rescue her. But there is some evidence that's been cited for the capture and execution theory. First, let's look at some of the variants of it. One version of the theory was proposed by CBS reporter Fred Gurner in a 1966 book called The Search for Amelia Earhart. He argued that they accidentally crashed on Saipan and were then executed. Another variant is offered by author Mike Campbell in his 2012 book, Amelia Earhart, The Truth at Last. He argued that she crashed in the Marshall Islands, but was later executed and buried on Saipan. Another variant was proposed by Pan Am pilot Henri Kaiser Andrew, who argued in his 1983, 1993 book, The Age of Heroes, that the Japanese didn't capture Amelia, but they did shoot down her plane. Now let's look at some of the evidence regarding these claims. In 1990, Unsolved Mysteries aired a program in which a woman from Saipan claimed to have witnessed Amelia and Fred's execution. There have been persistent rumors that a grave on Tinian Island, just five miles from Saipan, is the grave of Amelia and Fred. In his 2012 book, Michael Campbell lists claims from Marshall Islanders who said that they witnessed the crash. He also cites a U.S. Army sergeant who found a suspicious grave near a Japanese prison on Saipan. And in 2017, the History Channel produced a documentary called Amelia Earhart, The Lost Evidence, which featured a photograph from the Marshall Islands showing a a Caucasian man and woman who resembled Amelia sitting with her back to the camera. So how does all this evidence stack up when you cross-examine it? Not well. Just because people claim to have seen something doesn't make it true. People's memories from that long ago can be fuzzy. They can have seen something else like another wartime plane crash or execution and, you know, misremembered the time they saw it or misidentified what they were seeing. And especially when someone as famous as Amelia Earhart is involved, people can make stuff up to connect themselves to this famous mystery. Physical and documentary evidence from the period would be more convincing. But a 2004 archaeological examination on the, of the grave on Tinian Island didn't turn up any bones. Japanese records, which we gained access to during the occupation of Japan, don't reveal anything about capturing or executing the famous aviator. And the photo that the History Channel used in uh, 2017 to argue for the theory was immediately debunked. It turns out that it was originally published in a Japanese travel guide in October of 1935, almost two years before Amelia vanished, so it couldn't be her in the photograph. The biggest problem with the Japanese capture theory is the distance involved. Remember, the Itasca was at Howland Island, and they reported that at 7.58 a.m., Amelia made a voice broadcast that had the loudest possible signal indicating they were in the immediate area of Howland Island. Also, Amelia reported that they were very low on fuel. Between 7.30 and 7.40, she estimated they only had about a half hour less left of fuel. But the Marshall Islands are 800 miles away from Howland Island. Saipan is even further. It's 2,700 miles away. 
So there seems to be no way for Amelia to have made it from the immediate vicinity of Howland Island all the way to the Japanese South Pacific Mandate on half an hour of fuel. Not, you know, unless her plane suddenly accelerated beyond its flight capabilities to 1,600 miles an hour. And it was really fuel efficient. Yeah, Mach 2. <laughs> yeah, so consequently, none of the Japanese capture theories seem plausible. So what about the idea that Amelia and Fred crashed on New Britain? This is a theory that was proposed in 1990 by a man named Donald Angwin, who had served in the Australian Army during World War II. He reported that in 1945, he and other members of his unit found a wrecked aircraft in the jungle on New Britain. Uh, like Amelia's Electra, it was, a twi it was twin engined and made of unpainted metal. They also marked its position on a map and took down some serial numbers that were, vi that were visible on it. These serial numbers could be consistent with some of the specifications of the Electra, but they don't indicate it was hers in particular. Also, subsequent searches have not found this plane. The biggest problem, though, is that New Britain is 2,200 miles from Howland, and it would have taken Amelia 13 hours to get there. So it seems like there's no way for this to have happened with half an hour of fuel. Okay, then what about the crash and sink theory? In many ways, this seems to be the most likely hypothesis. The Pacific Ocean is big, and it has few landing spots. Since Amelia and Fred were in the immediate vicinity of Howland Island and low on fuel, it seems statistically likely that they crashed in sea that they crashed at sea and the Electra simply sank. They may have gotten out of the plane and maybe even floated for a while on a raft or with life vests or on wreckage, but if so, they didn't make it to Howland Island. So that's it? That's what happened to them? No the end of the mystery? Mm, well, maybe, but there's another possibility. Remember, some of the possible radio signals that were detected came from the direction of Gardner Island. Now, this island is now called Nicomororo, so don't be confused when you hear it referred to under that name in modern stories about this. Also, when the planes from the USS Colorado flew over Nicomororo, during the search, they saw signs of recent habitation, even though the island was supposed to be uninhabited at the time. And the Navy noted that the lagoon of Gardner Island was one where a seaplane could land or take off. Could Amelia have reached it? Possibly. It's about 350 miles from Howland Island. If Amelia and Fred were off course, and if they had a little more fuel than Amelia estimated they might, then it's possible that they could have made it there. Also, it's been argued that rather than continuing to look for Howland Island, once they realized they couldn't find it, they would have turned back on their course in search of other islands they had passed, and that would lead them back in the direction of Nicomororo. If they made it anywhere, Nicomororo is a good possibility, and so that's where most of the recent search efforts have been focused. So who's been investigating this theory then? A number of folks. One is a group called the International Group for Historical Aircraft Recovery, T-I-G-H-A-R, pronounced Tiger. Tiger has been investigating Nicomororo for years, and they've sent like 10 expeditions there. George Putnam Jr., Amelia's stepson, expressed support for their efforts before he died in 2013, though also elsewhere he said he thought the plane just ran out of gas. Another person focusing on Gardner Island is Robert Ballard. He's the guy who found the wreck of the Titanic. And in August of this year, 2019, the National Geographic Society funded him to lead an expedition there. And it's got a documentary pre premiering this Sunday, October 20th, about the expedition. Has there been any concrete evidence connecting Amelia with Gardner or Nicomoro Island? Possibly. They haven't found her plane. Ballard wasn't able to find it in his expedition, in part because it turns out the island is at the top of a really tall underwater mountain, and it has steep slopes with chutes uh, that funnel debris down into deep water. Ballard uh, thus didn't find the plane in the areas he searched, but he has ideas about where it could still be if Amelia and Fred made it to Gardner. On the other hand, there is some physical evidence that was found on the island. In 1937, some potential settlers visited the island, and one of them took a picture of the wreck of the SS Norwich City, 
which had crashed there in 1929. That's the 4,000-ton ship that the Navy saw when they flew over the island. In the background of one picture, there was an image of something sticking out of the water, and in 2010, one researcher proposed it was part of Amelia's landing gear. After 1937, though, her plane may have slid all the way down to the bottom, which is why Ballard didn't find it. In 1938, work on a settlement began on the island, and in 1940, a human skull was discovered on the island, along with some other bones, a bottle, a shoe, and the box for a sextant. Also, Tiger's expeditions have turned up more articles, according to Wikipedia, Artifacts discovered by Tiger on Nikumaroro have included improvised tools, an aluminum panel possibly from an Electra, made using 1930s manufacturing specifications, an oddly cut piece of clear plexiglass the same thickness and curvature of an Electra window, and a size 9 cat's paw shoe heel dating from the 1930s, which resembles Earhart's footwear in world flight photos. Recently discovered photos of Earhart's Electra just before departure in Miami show an aluminum panel over a window on the right side. Rick Gillespie, head of Tiger, claimed the found aluminum panel artifact has the same dimensions and rivet pattern as the one shown in the photo, quote, to a high degree of certainty, end quote. However, in 2017, the New England Air Museum cast doubt on that last claim. They found a match for the rivet pattern on another kind of plane, which was known to have crashed nearby during World War II, and the natives of Gardner Island admitted bringing aluminum from that crash to the island. So it could be from that other plane. What about the human bones that were found? The bones were transferred to the island of Fiji for further investigation, where they were examined in 1941 by Dr. D.W. Hoodless of Central Medical School. According to Wikipedia, Hoodless concluded that the person was about five feet, five and a half inches tall. Hoodless wrote that the skeleton, quote, could be that of a short, stocky, muscular European or even a half caste or person of mixed European descent, end quote. Earhart's 1930 pilot's license states that she was 5 feet 8 inches and 118 pounds. Hoodless also wrote, quote, It may be definitely stated that the skeleton is that of a male, end quote, the word male emphasized in the original. Hoodless further stated, quote, Owing to the weather-beaten condition of all the bones, it is impossible to be dogmatic in regard to the age of the person at the time of death, but I am of the opinion that he was not less than 45 years of age, and that probably he was older, say between 45 and 55 years, end quote. Earhart was 39 years and 11 months when she disappeared. Hoodless offered to make more detailed measurements if needed, but suggested any further examination be done by the Anthropological Department at Sydney University. So Hoodless didn't think that the bones could have been Earhart's, but that still leaves the possibility that they might have been Fred Noonan's. Uh, I haven't seen anything eliminating him as a possibility, and he was age 44 at the time of the disappearance, and he was male. So that fits with some of the things that uh, Dr. Hoodless thought. On the other hand, Dr. Hoodless's uh, findings have been disputed. According to Wikipedia, In 1998, an analysis of the measurement data by forensic anthropologists found instead that the skeleton had belonged to a, quote, tall white female of Northern European ancestry, end quote. However, a 2015 review of both analyses concluded that, quote, the most robust scientific analysis and conclusions are those of the original British finding, indicating that the Niku Maroro bones belong to a robust middle-aged man, not Amelia Earhart, end quote. A 2018 study by American anthropologist Richard Jantz, one of the authors of the 1998 Tiger Report, estimated the size of Earhart's skeleton based on photographs and reanalyzed the earlier data using modern forensic techniques. Based on measurements of 2,700 Americans who died in the mid-20th century, the study concluded that Earhart's bone measurements more closely matched the Nicomaroro bones than 99% of the reference sample. However, others criticized the study for being based on little factual evidence, in particular seven measurements from the skeleton done in 1941, combined with estimates about Earhart's size based on photos, and doubted the accuracy of those measurements. So the study of the bones is inconclusive. Can we just DNA test the bones and settle it? 
Well, that would be great. But after they were taken to Fiji, they were lost. Oh. Uh, can they get more bones? Why didn't they find a whole skeleton? Tiger has pointed out that Nicomararo Island is home to coconut crabs. Coconut crabs are, despite their cute name, are the largest land-dwelling arthropods in the world. They grow to a maximum size of three feet, three inches across from one leg end to the other. They are so named because they are powerful enough to open coconuts and eat the insides. But they're also omnivores, and they'll eat anything, including flesh. They're thus also called robber crabs because they will steal and eat anything left on the ground. Tiger proposes that the crabs or other scavengers would have dealt with the bodies on Gardner Island. Then over time, the crabs carried off the bones so that only a few could be found. In fact, Tiger did an experiment with a pig carcass, and they found that over time, coconut crabs did carry off the pig bones. So first they ate the pig flesh, then they took the bones. Whether it was the crabs that did it or not, though, something happened to the other bones on Nicomaroro because complete skeletons weren't found in 1940. So one way or another, bones got moved, disappeared, whatever. That means that there might still be bones there to find on Nicomaroro, and we potentially could test those. Also, some of the bones may have been found during this year's National Geographic expedition. According to Microsoft News, an expedition land team led by National Geographic Society archaeologist Frederick Hebert may have found fragments of the skull in the Te Amwanibong Museum and Cultural Center in Tarawa, Kiribati. According to Aaron Kimmerly, a forensic anthropologist at the University of South Florida, the skull belonged to an adult female. Quote, We don't know if it's her or not, but all lines of evidence point to the 1940 bones being in this museum, end quote, she says. They'll know more when the skull has been reconstructed and its DNA tested, which should happen in the next few months. So we might have DNA results at some point soon. So, Jimmy, what is your bottom line on the mystery of the disappearance of Amelia Earhart? We can't be certain here. The most likely theory of what happened is probably the crash and sink theory, just statistically. Next to that, the most likely theory is that they made it to Gardner or Nicomaroro Island. Either way, we're likely to eventually find out. If they crash near Howland Island, we'll probably find their plane on the bottom of the ocean someday, maybe by a drone that's exploring that area. If they made it to Nicomaroro, we'll either find their plane or DNA testing will eventually reveal bones from one or both of them. So while we don't yet know the answer, we probably will one day. You know, on that crash and think theory, it reminds me of the, the Malaysian Airlines flight that disappeared, which uh, maybe will be a future episode. Yeah. <laughs> crash, and, crash and sink. Yeah, yeah. And definitely we'll be doing a Malaysia Airline one. The ocean is so vast that things can just disappear in the ocean. So, uh, okay. So uh, that's our bottom line. Jimmy, what, is, what do we have for further resources for people who want to go more into this? So I uh, have a link to Elgin and Marie Long's book, Amelia Earhart, The Mystery Solved, which advocates the crash and sink theory. Rick Gillespie of Tiger's book, Finding Amelia, The True Story of the Earhart Disappearance, and that advocates the Gardner Island theory. Fred Gurner's book, The Search for Amelia Earhart, which advocates the Japanese capture theory. Henri Kaiser Andrews' uh, book, Age of Heroes, which is the Japanese shoot-down theory. And believe it or not, uh, Joe Class's book, Amelia Earhart Lives, that is the one that said she was this woman in New Jersey named Irene Bolam. Even though that got withdrawn from the market by McGraw-Hill, it's back in print. <laughs> and so you can read that. We'll also have a link to the information about the night where you actually where you can buy. It's on Amazon. The 1943 movie Flight to Freedom, where Rosalind Russell plays essentially Amelia Earhart. Also, we'll have obviously Wikipedia's article on Amelia, their article on Fred Noonan, their article on Irene Bolam. Information on the 2019 National Geographic Expedition to Nicomaroro, uh, more information on that, and a link to Unsolved Mysteries. Their, their complete run is now finally on Amazon Prime, and so it will have a link to where you can watch Season 3, Episode 8 of their treatment of the Amelia Earhart Japanese Capture Theory. 
We'll also have info on the 2017 History Channel documentary that was based on that photograph, as well as a Daily Beast article debunking the History Channel photo theory. Uh, We'll have Tiger's website and information on coconut crabs, including a picture of a coconut crab on a trash can. (laughs) So, So you can see it for scale. It's one of these huge plastic trash cans. And a coconut crab is just clinging to the side of this thing. I once saw an image of this as an internet meme, and someone had the same reaction that I did upon seeing the size of this. Kill it with fire. <laughs> I mean, just this is too dangerous to have around. Yeah, coconut crabs, they're, they're creepy looking. Uh, yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. Those are going to be some great resources. And, uh, and of course, the uh, additional one is that uh, documentary coming out this Sunday as we're releasing this. Uh, right. We'll have that that documentary. And we'll follow up in the future if there's any big revelations from from that. Uh, so you expect us to, to come back with some some more on that. And then uh, let's talk about our feedback from our listeners. Uh, this feedback is coming from our episode on mind control parasites. And I'll just read a couple of them first right off the bat. You'll understand why. Uh, Lauren on Facebook writes, Ew, cool. And then Dave Arcudi on YouTube writes, Scrunchy face, ick, ick, ick. And then Amy Rab on YouTube writes, this was so gross and so cool. (laughs) And that's why we did it. It was both gross and cool, and the patrons requested it. (laughs) Exactly. Uh, Dan on Facebook writes, my daughter, who is age eight, said as I turned on the podcast while in the car, oh, no, I don't want to listen to a boring podcast. 20 minutes later, as we walked back to the car from running an errand, my daughter said, Dad, can we listen to more about mind control parasites? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I've been amazed at how many people tell us they listen with their children or that their children listen. And we were not expecting that when we started this podcast. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, being family friendly guys, we kept it fan- family friendly. And it turns out we've got a lot of listeners who are from the younger set uh, just this weekend at the Catholic Answers Conference. Uh, when we're recording this feedback, uh, I had a gentleman come up to me and tell me the same thing. So it uh, renews our efforts to keep the program family friendly. And we're great that uh, parents find it a valuable resource, not just for themselves, but for their children that uh, entertains and informs. Exactly. I appreciate that at myself uh, for my own kids. They enjoy it too, but we, you know, we don't play everything for them, but uh, we yeah. listen to the Manson one with them, <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, but uh, they enjoy the ones that uh, they get to hear. Patrick Sweeney writes on YouTube, what's so great about Mysterious World is you don't need a specific interest in the topic. Jimmy and Dom know that and draw you into the story. Each Mysterious World is a little bit campfire storytelling and a little bit lecture. Yeah, and uh, I think that's an astute analysis. I think consciously as I'm preparing the outlines about how to you know, tell this in narrative form so that it forms a story that'll draw people in. And then eventually we flip the switch and turn into the analysis mode. Yeah. Yeah. I think that works well. Deviant Spark One on YouTube writes, great episode. I wonder how long it takes these things to develop and get it right. I mean, are there failed parasites that tell ants to try to fly and do other crazy things? Well, evolutionary theory would say, yeah, that uh, in the process of a uh, of a parasite evolving to affect a particular host, uh, you're going to have a lot of mutations that don't achieve what the end result is going to be. But eventually those mutations will end up either the parasite strain will die out or it'll adapt in some way to where it can get back to where it needs to to complete its life cycle. Brooke Kennel writes on YouTube, Phew, I made it through this episode. Count me as someone who does not like bugs. But this episode was not as paranoia-inducing as I was afraid it might be. Thanks for giving a great episode that didn't trigger my OCD. Too much. You've got me curious about the pregnant women eating dirt thing, by the way. Just increase my patronage. Love you guys and your work. Hope we can help keep the great content coming. Thank you so much, Brooke. Thank you for your generosity and for increasing your support. That's awesome. It'll help us get even closer to the break-even point that we're working on right now. And yeah, as we mentioned in the Parasites episode, there is a biological purpose why pregnant women sometimes eat dirt and also why children do too. It can help their immune system and help uh, flush out and deal with parasites. That's right. And if you want to read about that, uh, it's discussed in the book, This Is Your Brain on Parasites, which is one of the books I recommended for that episode. Excellent. So, Jimmy, what do we have for mysterious headlines? Well, speaking of pilots who don't show up, like Amelia didn't at Howland Island, I've got a link to a story about a British traveler who flew a plane to Spain 
when the pilot didn't show up. <laughs> so guy gets on a plane with his family, pilot doesn't show up, he flies to Spain instead. Actually, the airline asked him to do this because he was another pilot for that airplane who was going on for that airline who was going on vacation. When it turned out the scheduled pilot didn't show up, he phoned the airline and said, hi, the pilot hasn't shown up, but I'm here and I've got my license with me. Do you want me to do this? And they said, yes, please. (laughs) (laughs) That is awesome. (laughs) Um, Also, speaking of DNA testing things in the water. Environmental, we've got a link to a story on environmental DNA rules out giant monsters in Loch Ness, but maybe not giant eels. So what they did was they took a water, like water sample from Loch Ness. They scanned all the environmental DNA that was in the water looking for things. And they found a surprising amount of eel DNA. Hmm. And so thanks to Mark on Facebook for pointing out this article. Also... I'll have a link to uh, one I found on a large eel filmed in the river Ness, which connects to Loch Ness. And you can see there's like a fish in the foreground and this big, huge eel goes by in the background. (laughs) So uh, you can take a look at that and see the size of some of the eels that are around in that area. And this is one of the proposals at the moment. Maybe the Loch Ness monster is a big eel. (laughs) All right. So, Jimmy, in a second, I'm going to ask you what our uh, next episode is going to be about. But first, I do want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including uh, Aileen G, uh, Hiram G, Todd B, Jared S, and Anthony M. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So, Jimmy, what is our next episode going to be about? Next episode is going to be our patrons requested episode for the month. It's going to be on numbers stations, including the mysterious letter beacons that may be operating in the South Pacific where Amelia disappeared. Mm, Interesting. So that's it from us. Uh, What do you think about the disappearance of Amelia Earhart? Do you have theories? Do you have uh, an opinion about uh, any of the theories that we mentioned? And and if you watch this National Geographic documentary, let us know what you think about it. You can do so by going to sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page. You can also send us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com or send a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of Mysterious Feedback. Be sure to check out the Mysterious World bookstore at mysteriousworldstore.com for links to all of the books and videos that Jimmy mentions in the show, not just in this episode, they'll all be there, but for all the shows we've done. And when you purchase anything through those links, it helps support the show. We really appreciate it. Uh, You can find links to all of the resources that Jimmy mentioned and links to those mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest.